Propertyology regards right now as a very exciting time for investing in Australian real estate. There are some fantastic opportunities that Propertyology can help you take advantage of before buyers re-emerge from their coronavirus cocoons. Propertyology has a national focus. Now more than ever, experience and knowledge are the most valuable currency. Propertyology has that in spades. To find out how Propertyology's multi-award winning buyers agents can help you prosper, contact them now at propertyology.com.au. Welcome to the Smart Property Investment Show with your host, Phil Tarrant. Hi, good everyone. How are you going? Uh, thanks for joining us on the podcast today. It's a real privilege for us to uh, share this property investing journey that we're going through as an organization as, and as individuals. And as you do the same, you know, we get a real kick out of it telling these stories. And, uh, and I must admit, you know, I do enjoy speaking to the experts and understanding what they're doing, how they're going about doing stuff, how they're supporting people into properties. And we're fortunate in Australia that have some great buyers, agents, and other sort of supporting mechanisms like accountants and conveyances and all sort of stuff. But I love the investor stories. So often the two things merge. And, and what I've found over the years is that um, a lot of people end up in property as a profession as a result of initially being property investors. And we tell a lot of these stories of people making that transition. And today's sort of aligned with that, you know, two investors who have been at this for a little while. Um, and I now do this as their day jobs, but um, been investing for many, many years. And you would have heard of them on the podcast before. Scott Melinda Jennison from Streamline Property and Watch This Space. Also, we're going to do a really cool live stream uh, with Melinda over the coming weeks, looking at and breaking down the Brisbane markets. A lot of people are talking about it right now. Uh, so go and check it out. You can go and register smartpropertyinvestment.com to you for that live stream. You can ask us questions. We'll answer anything you really want, but that's not the purpose of today's chat. The purpose of today's chat is actually get the backstory from these two about their investing journey, how they've actually ended up you know, turning a passion for property investment into a profession, but I actually want to work out where it all began. Guys and girls, how are you going? You well? Good, Phil. Very well. Thanks for having us back again. No worries. How have you been sort of over the last couple of months or so through all this COVID stuff? Pretty good. I mean, being locked down has had its challenges, three boys schooling at home and, um, you know, nothing different to what everybody else is experiencing. And you know, business obviously slowed down. There was a lot of uncertainty out there in the market, especially here in Queensland with some crazy rental um, reforms proposed. But we seem to have got through the other side and things are definitely picking back up. Kids are back at school, which is always a bonus. And um, yeah, business is almost business as usual in a new way. So purpose of today's chat is to get the inside story of your journey through property. But I guess while I've got you, we're going to get do a deep dive, Melinda, in that. I'm really looking forward to it, the um, live broadcast that we're going to be doing. We'll get stuck into it all. What do you reckon about this home builder stuff, though? It just came out yesterday. Thoughts? Well, pretty exciting to see that homeowners have the benefit of some renovation rebates. I think that it could have been a little bit more pointed in terms of not requiring as high a threshold for um, the renovation budgets. I think certainly here in Brisbane, it's going to take a significant renovation to qualify for a minimum $150,000 spend. And, you know, it's something that we're always talking to clients about the buy and renovate strategy. But in this instance, it doesn't apply to investors either. So you do have to be a home buyer or a current home owner to qualify. And obviously with the income thresholds in place as well, there's only going to be a very small segment of the market that will qualify. So It's quite interesting, Phil. It's something that we talk about quite a lot and obviously coming from a, the building background, as you know, myself, I'm helping clients to do this type of thing to push and as we'll talk about probably in our journey, what we've done and how we've actually created it by manufacturing equity in the properties. But a big thing that we do say to people is you can change the house, but you can't change the location. So if you find the house in the right location you're after, that's where you can change it. So this, this could have play in that as well. That's a really, a really important point, Scott, and I'm happy you made it. Um, and, you know, knowing a little bit about your portfolio and your journey, and we'll get into it today, um, a lot of the stuff that you have done would benefit from the scheme they've put in place. But, Scott, you know, you've been a builder for many years. Yeah, top line, and I'm just trying to remember from all the stuff I've read about it so far, the renovation side of things between 150 and 700 grand, but the property can't be worth any more than 1.5 million bucks, right? So it's... You know, it's a big reno to spend 750000 bucks on something that's existing uh, to turn into $1.5 million property, even at $150,000. 
you know, this is not cosmetic stuff, right? This is going to be structural renovation, Scott, isn't it? That's a big, that's a lot of money to spend on a reno. It is, it is. And there's opportunities, especially in the Brisbane area. You can buy properties fairly close to the CBD under that price range and add the value with the renovation. So there is actually a lot of opportunity in it. I think when people look at it, people will think renovations are cheap. You'd be, a lot of people will be very surprised and we do tell people it's probably cheaper to build new than it is to actually to renovate. So you can chew into a lot of money when you start getting renovations. But, you know, having said that, if you can get it around the 150 or, or thereabouts, you know, it could be a kitchen for $25,000. That's a pretty good kitchen. So, yeah, there's those little things you could actually work it in to make it um, beneficial and worthwhile. I think you see sort of knock down rebuild stuff as part of this. Yeah, I think it's a clever strategy buying something that can be knocked down and rebuilt. Again, if you're an owner-occupier, that's where you're going to benefit. The issue, I think, will be where people spend this money just because of the government rebate and potentially overcapitalise. And I think that, you know, that is the danger when the government releases these sorts of stimulus packages. People shouldn't spend money just because they can. It really needs to be part of an overall plan to ensure that you're not overcapitalising because, you know, if you spend that money because the government's going to give you a $25,000 rebate, sometimes, you know, if you have to sell in two or three years' time and you've overcapitalised, you may not get that money back. So it could all work against you. So it's really important to understand why you're doing it and make sure that you're not going to overcapitalise. Yeah, again, a really important point, Melinda, in, in that, you know, you've got to spend one fifty to get twenty five back. It means you've got a lot of skin in the game. The government has a little bit of skin in the game. And the biggest issue most people have with renovations is that they overcapitalize, whether it's an owner occupier, which is what we're talking about, or even investing and they don't get that money back. So yeah, I've been really supportive of how the government's approached COVID-19 and look at the stimulate the economy. And now we're sort of, the treasurer says we're officially in a recession. So, you know, I've got to tip my hat to a lot of the work the government's done. This one here, mm, let's see how it goes. And the big scheme of things, it's not a huge amount of money when it comes to the whole sort of government budget, but yeah, watch your space. We'll have a chat about it and see how we go. But this is not about home builder schemes. This is about your journey investing in property. And I know you specialize in the Brizzy market as a buyer's agent, but let's have a chat about your portfolio. When and how did it all begin? Why, Scott, are you in property? Is this by accident? Um, no. So probably going back a few years without giving up too much of my age, I guess. But um, in the sort of late 80s, I grew up in Tamworth, country New South Wales. I was an apprentice carpenter with my father. And back then, not earning a lot of money, and I can't remember what it was, but it wasn't a lot. Mum and dad, let's say they encouraged me to buy a block of land, almost forcefully, but it was a good force, I think. And they deducted part of my wage back then to pay off the block of land. Back then, we were paying interest rates about 19%. So that's quite different to what we are now. And a bit further down the track, dad and I built on that block of land and sold the house. So that was the start for me. A bit of a different way to start it, but I just it opened my eyes up completely to what you can do with property. Yeah, and so your parents were investors, or they've always had a bit of a, a bent in in property. Was it? Is that really the stop? You, I guess, growing up in Tamworth, probably drinking rum at B and S balls <laughs> and uh, and trying to squirrel some money away for a rainy day. Was that just a? Uh, was it an education piece more than anything? To uh... I think so. Yeah, look, mum and dad have always, and I only realised the other day when we sat down and, and worked things out that. Every property that they've lived in, they've actually built and lived in it for a certain amount of time, obviously, and then sold. So it's just the way that they do things. They, I think, just it grew into us, and that's the way we did it. We bought, and mm. we built, and benefited from what we can actually do ourselves. Do you still have this property in Tamworth? No, no, it's no. well gone. Okay, so you bought a place, built. What sort of happened after that? When when did this go from being a, a Scotch journey in property into two people's sort of? Uh, combined investing in property. What's the backstory there? There's got to be something, I'm sure. So after a few years of traveling around playing sport, I decided to relocate up to Queensland and I moved up to the Sunshine Coast and bought shares in a house with another friend and his wife. And we bought a house at Pridgeon Beach. Again, pushed a bit of hard labor into that one and did some renovations and some work. And during that time, I happened to be playing hockey actually in Brisbane and I met Melinda through hockey here in Brisbane. So that's when I came onto the scene and um, <laughs> not long after that, we'd only been together 12 months, not yet married, clearly, but we purchased our first home together and my father was a property investor and he okay. always drilled into me that rent's dead money and it was just part of my upbringing, I guess, that you know I was always going to own my own home. So when I moved in with Scott, we decided to buy our house together 
And um, that was the start of the journey for us. So we bought our first home here in Brisbane in a suburb called Fernie Grove, which is uh, northwest of Brisbane. And um, again, we renovated that house and forced value into that house to improve the overall equity position as well. That's good. I really want to drill down into this first property purchase and owner occupied and, and doing a reno. But before we do that, we'll just go to a quick break back in a moment. Love property? The current Buyer's Agent of the Year and Director of Pure Property Investment, Paul Glossop, does too. And right now, he's offering you the chance to secure his best-selling book, A Surfer's Guide to Property Investing, absolutely free. Simply jump on Pure Property Investment's Facebook page, hit the message button and type Smart Property to claim your free book today. Uh, welcome back, everyone. Uh, Phil Tarrant here, host of the Smart Property Investment Show with property investors, Melinda and Scott Jennison, who would appear bought their first place together before they were married. That's uh, that's what happened. You, you must have been sure of it. <laughs> it was back in 1996, <laughs> so, you know, a couple of decades ago now, but, you know, I don't know. And our second, actually. And <laughs> we actually upgraded our home together before we were married as well, so... <laughs> So, Must have so known tell it was me about right. when we were sitting around one. And I don't need to get into the romantic story of how you guys met, but um, we were sitting around at some point saying, "Oh, it's time to move in together." Uh, that awkward conversation of, "Should you move into my place, or I move into your place, or should we buy something?" That's a that's a big. <laughs> well, I think the uh, I think <laughs> the situation travel. was that um, Scott was had his property up at Parisian Beach, and I was in Brisbane, and I think. For the relationship to progress, we needed to be in the same location. So Scott decided to move to Brisbane. And uh, look, we did some traveling together overseas before we actually purchased that home together. So we had sort of been living in each other's pockets for Mm. a number of months. And, you know, it just seemed right at the time. It wasn't a discussion around should we rent. Um, We had no other base in Brisbane other than my parents and that wasn't going to work for our relationship. So we just decided to pull resources and and purchase a home. And was it the big European backpacker trip? Yeah, um, again, from the hockey background, I went over there and I played a bit of hockey in England. So we were lucky enough to get taken care of pretty well. Did some a couple of years over there and then when we settled in back here and we'd had enough of the travel, that's when we decided to buy the property. Mm. So you're a pretty reasonable hockey player then? Oh, half decent, I suppose. Half decent. Where, where in England were you? Uh, Southampton. Okay. That's cool. Yeah, down yeah, south. So it, yeah, it was good fun. A lot of fun. We did some traveling as well. So we played the hockey, coached, worked there. And then um, in the off season, we'd travel a bit before we came back here to play again. So it was a lot of fun. I imagine uh, UK building sites in the middle of winter are probably quite a fun place to work. Yeah, a bit different. <laughs> <laughs> what did you learn in the building trade out there that you didn't really get in Australia that you've brought back here? Anything uh, they do differently or? Um, Any, anything exceptional that sort of helped you on your way here? Yeah, not not a lot really over there. It was, it was just, <laughs> it was wet and cold. So I guess we learned how to make sure that the roofs didn't leak. That was one probably big thing. <laughs> it's pretty good. So back in Australia, you've bought this. So which suburb was it? Did you buy your first place? Fernie Hills. So oh, Fernie yeah. Hills. Okay. Yeah. And tell us about the property. So you renovated it. So it probably needed a bit of work. What did you pay for it? What attracted you to that particular investment? Did you buy it on the purpose of maybe one day renting it out? Like how did you sort of frame or shape those decision making? Yeah, we bought it for $115,000 and that, you know, at the time seemed like a reasonable investment, but you know, the purpose was always just as a home. We didn't have a plan at that point in time as to what we wanted to do with it. You know, we weren't as experienced as we are now in terms of making sure you have exit strategies and things like that in place. We just wanted somewhere to live that was nice and leafy and green and and that's what we went out to find. And it was back in the time where you used to go to the real estate agent, jump in their car and they'd drive you around to look at different properties. And um, we found this property and it was a standard Chamfer board, high set, three bedroom, one bathroom, you know, very modest home. And, you know, we made it our own by building in underneath and, you know, enclosing it as a bit of a rumpus room area. And Scott had a bar in there. Like, you know, we were living the dream, to be honest. It was quite fun. <laughs> so you renovated. What did the renos cost you? Do you remember? Or was it just a sort of weekend work? Was it all leftover building materials? Just yeah, it, it up in your frame. It was. Yeah. Look, we did everything ourselves. So the bathroom renovation. We even a kitchen through a contact that we had. We picked up a, a second a display kitchen, and we managed to get the display kitchen and put that in there, and then tidied it all up. So we did it on a budget. 
Uh, we had a lot of friends that came out and helped us and paid them with a bit of probably beer and barbecue type of payment, which is a very, very high currency. And we got it done on a budget. Uh, we did it all and it was lovely. It really suited what we needed. And how long did the whole process take from sort of first bit of work to the end of it? Well, we owned the property for about five years. So I think it was just a progressive, you know, process. We didn't sort of set out to get it up to a certain level. We just decided, mm. you know, that we'd paint and then we decided to do it the kitchen and then we upgraded the bathroom and then we built in under. So, you know, it was progressive. There was no time frame. It probably took all of the five years that we oh, owned fine. it. Yeah. Where did you find your motivation, Scott, like being on building sites all week and then, you know, the weekends ahead of you, you know, probably a bit of sport and stuff and on, on a Saturday morning, but were you spending all weekend doing stuff at home renovating or did you sort of well, get on, some good satisfaction out of yeah, it? Yeah, on and off. I think we got the satisfaction out of it because we could just see what we're turning into from just a, a standard sort of house, I guess, to a nice home. And it really, I think just the satisfaction out of what we are actually doing for ourselves is probably what drove us that way. And it, mm. it was after probably when we had finished it all that we realised what we've done and what we can actually do with property. And then what the revised value was as a result of the equity that we'd been able to manufacture and not just, you know, sitting waiting for the capital growth to drive itself. And I think that was a light bulb moment for both of us, to yeah. be honest. We both thought, hey, this is actually something that we can do again. And because we'd done it in our own home, and this is pre-kids, so you've got so much time on your hands before you have kids, we just thought that we could, you know, we had a, a formula that worked, so let's just do it again. So we set about finding a real renovator and that was the mm. next purchase. So satisfaction, you know, emotional satisfaction and from the renos, I don't, and I have no real skills as a builder, I get a lot of satisfaction out of doing stuff like, you know, when your day job's talking, which is what I do mainly, to actually get my hands dirty and get some calluses going. Yeah, I get a lot of satisfaction out of that sort of work, you know, which is pretty cool. And that's a good thing, but yeah, you, know, you also get satisfaction out of, you know, dollars in your back pocket. You 115k purchase price. What did you end up selling it for when you exited? It was just over one hundred and fifty thousand dollars over five okay. years. Yeah, and okay. the cost was more time than material cost in the renovation because we just did most of it ourselves. Mm. And and that light bulb moment you mentioned about manufacturing equity and to Scott's earlier point, even when it comes to this home builder thing, you know, it's where you buy. It's the location that does all the heavy lifting. Mm. Mm. mainly in terms of capital growth and location being ongoing developments and all this sort of stuff, right? We don't need to get into that today. But the manufacturing equity, for a lot of people, it's a realisation where they go, like they first hear the term manufacturing equity and they go, well, what does that mean? It sounds really technical. And what it is is about taking a product A into product B by spending as little money as possible to achieve that. And it sounds as though that's what you've done. So mm. you, know, you having that realisation of going, oh, we've sort of done that maybe by chance or accident. You didn't set out to do it, but look at the outcome from it. So hang on a second, let's break that down and work out whether there's some science around it and start going again. And, and I see a lot of property investors go down uh, through that journey. So tell me about what happened next after. So you sold this place. Were you looking for a new place? Well, we'd actually bought another property before we sold and we came right into four kilometres out from the CBD and we'd bought a real renovator, which was an old Queenslander home that really was unlivable at the time that we purchased it. Uh, we had a 30-day settlement because we bought that at auction and so we realised we had to, you know, sell our home at Fernie Hills so that we could use that excess money into renovating the new property that we'd purchased. So that was in 2001 and we said about, you know, we purchased one and then we sold the other and then we had 30 days. We had a 60-day settlement on the Fernie Hills sale and then we had 30 days to get the property that we'd purchased livable because we had nowhere to live otherwise. So, you mm. know... We worked hard for a 30-day period. <laughs> Did you sell the other one at a distressed rate or do you think you got market value for it? We got market value. It actually sold within the first 24 hours. I think there were a few buyers on it because it was a little bit different. We had put our heart and soul into it and you know, we were quite house proud. So I think that it had good strong demand, which is obviously what we always look for when, when selecting assets now. But it wasn't a distressed sale. We didn't have to sell. We just chose to sell so that we could fund stage two of the renovation. Stage one, we already had the funds for, and that was just to get it to a livable standard. But we had big plans for the property that we purchased. So you bought a Queensland. Is this the house that's still home for you? Yes. Yeah. Okay, cool. So maybe a forever home, who knows? But um, so tell us about what attracted you to this particular, which suburb are you in? 
We're in Wilston, which is just four kilometres north of the Brisbane CBD. Okay, in Wilston. So yeah. what attracted you? So you're buying this home for two purposes. One is to live in, but number two is to realise the capital the manufacturing equity in it by doing some work to it. So what was your sort of personal brief to go out there? Did you look for a character home? Did you look for something that you knew was really a renovator's delight and you could spend a lot of money on it? Like, you know, did you go in there knowing that you wanted to do structural renovations rather than cosmetic renovations? So tell us about that. So the place was actually up for auction. Melinda was at QUT, the university, which is literally five minute, 10 minute walk, walking distance from here. I was working at the time with another construction company as a project manager. The office was not far from here as well, a couple of blocks away. But before the auction, we'd actually sketched up our plans. So we, when we came to the property for inspection, we did a quick measure up. We'd sketched up the plans. We'd drawn the renovations. I'd done a budget on the renovations. We'd actually planned everything up front before we came to the auction. So we knew what we were sort of walking into, how much we could afford to buy it for, what the renovation would cost to what we'd walk out with. And the property itself, you say it's a Queensland, is it one of those really ornate looking Queenslanders or is it, you know, or you've made it into an ornate Queenslander? As we understand it, it was built in 1926. So it was in a state of disrepair when we purchased Mm. it. There was an old gentleman that was in a wheelchair that was living here. So it wasn't in a state that we would have wanted to occupy it. And we have maintained the traditional features of the property, but given it a modern edge, you know, throughout Mm. the time that we've owned the property. And the good thing about Queensland as being tin and timber is that you can actually add bits on, you know, in various locations, you can lift them, build under, you can extend, and it's actually quite easy because you're just tying it all into the existing timber. That's obviously where Scott's building knowledge always comes into play. I come up with an idea because I'm quite a visual person and Scott just tells me anything's possible, it's just going to cost. And she always says that it's easy, as she just did. (laughs) It is always easy. It is. You guys can do anything, right? (laughs) So tell us about the auction. So you've come armed, you know, you were there to buy. This wasn't sort of some tire kicking. You've spent a lot of time, effort, energy, and you've done what people should do if they're buying, you know, renovators, inverted, inverted commas, renovators delights or projects for renovation you need to go in there knowing what your net and end result is and what you're going to do and what the strategy is going to be before you even start at the auction but tell us about the auction tell us about where you set your where your price and why you set your price that way I actually can't remember how where our limit was set but I do remember that we were well under we were a few thousand dollars under the limit where we ended up purchasing right. the property but it was a really hot February day and the humidity was to match. So the auctioneer decided to, instead of having the auction outside where there were some mango trees with a lot of rotting mango, so it was quite, it stank to be honest, they Mm. brought everyone inside, which we thought was even better because it was pretty smelly inside as well. And I think that that can turn some buyers off when they're, we're bidding at auction. Whereas we just had a plan and we knew where we where our, you know, stop point was. And, you know, it was scary. That was the first auction we'd ever been involved in as property buyers, you know, or for our own benefit as well. So I remember shaking at the knees during the auction, but we got there and, you know, we ended up being the highest bidder. And when the hammer went down, we freaked out and thought, what have we just done? (laughs) We've just bought a a lot of work. (laughs) A very normal sentiment. And you talk about their detachment and, that detachment at the auction is absolutely critical is where most people do auctions wrong is where they get emotionally invested, not only in the process or they get emotionally invested in the theater around an auction or some of the stresses around it. So you've been able to have that detachment, which is, you know, putting aside the fact that it stinks and it's not very nice and visually whatever, because you knew what you wanted to achieve out of it, where all those other people who didn't, they weren't prepared, they weren't planned, they didn't have that sophistication to actually be that well ready to undertake the auction it probably impacted them. So how did you celebrate the win after you sort of had that initial, oh no, what are we going to do? What have we done? This is crazy too. Did you have a nice glass of champagne and then just a big deep breath and go, what do we do now? (laughs) It was actually, it was quite funny. We were still living at Fanny Hills at the time. No one was living here. So the elderly gentleman that had moved out of here, we grabbed our friends that were living down around the road from us. We drove in and um, we had a quiet drink on the front uh, footpath of the, where the house is. And walked around to Ballymore and watched the rugby union for the night and then walked back and uh, headed home after that. So it was, it was very convenient to be able to walk to Ballymore to watch the rugby at the time when the Reds used to play there. 
Yeah, no, very good. So, so you had a thirty day settlement. Yeah. So you ponied it up. How much did you end up paying? We paid two hundred and seventy two thousand at auction. Okay, okay. So probably ten percent, ten percent deposit. So you've given it. Probably gave him a physical check saying, "Here is my, here is it my, was, uh, my deposit." Was it that time? Yes. Yeah, a couple of drinks, game of footy. Thirty days later, you get the keys. What was the first thing you do, Scott? Demolish. <laughs> uh, internally, just literally got in and we just started knocking out the old kitchen, knocking out walls, just making a complete mess. That was pretty much the first few days, actually. And in fact, I remember that, you know, we got the keys and Scott was working up until 10 p.m. most nights just because we had a timeline to work through. But by the time my parents came to see the new home that we'd bought I remember my mum walking in and she was almost in tears thinking you've just sold this beautiful home and what have you purchased so it's funny when people don't have the vision but we just knew what we wanted to create and you know that didn't deter us it just made us more determined to prove that we knew what we were doing and that you know it was going to become the home that you know we had envisaged. Yeah and Scott I guess you know you're in a very fortunate position in that you've got the skills around construction a lot of people are attracted to you know, renovation type properties on the basis of maybe watching some knockdown rebuild television show or something or other and the reality of doing it and watching it two very different things so you've got the skills got the capabilities you can get in there how planned were you in you said you had some plans at the auction stage but had you actually drawn up detailed plans about what you're doing or you sort of knew what you're going to do so you just got in there and and did it yeah no we would pretty much drawn up everything i'd sketched everything up to what we actually what we wanted to look like how we wanted to finish things each room, knocking out walls, adding in walls, changing everything, lifting it, building it underneath. So we'd pretty much had that for the basic house itself. We'd known it all. I'd planned it all, priced it all up, and we had a really good idea of what we're actually heading into. Mm. So you actually had a budget. So the first property, you sort of did it over a number of years and you ended up with something which is pretty cool. This time you went, we know where we're starting point is. We know where our end point is. And how far between that start and end point was it? We sort of had three stages. So we had the first 30 days where we just needed to make it livable internally. So we needed to have one bathroom and a kitchen and a bedroom as a minimum done, ready to move in. So we achieved that within the first 30 days. When we moved in, internally upstairs was all but done, but outside was still falling down around us. And I remember at times actually entering and exiting through a bay window via a ladder because we had no stairs. So, you know, that's just what happens. Stage two was the lift. We were already living in the property. So we lifted the property and we put it up on stilts and then built in under. That was stage two. And then stage three was when we actually fitted out the underneath part of the property with more bedrooms, additional bathrooms, office space, and things like that. So we had staged it for financial reasons, but as well as just working around life because, it, you know, Scott was doing a lot of the work himself. So we just needed to make sure that we had the time to complete it. And did you start having kids during the period of the renovation or was that all after? No, no. So it always happens whether you renovate or, or build, Phil, from a builder's side of it, people always have deadlines. And usually mm. they want something done before Christmas or before Easter. They're probably the big dates that builders hate. Our final one to have it livable and to be a bit house proud was um, before we got married. So we decided to get married. So the deadline was obviously before we get married, we want this house to look half decent so that when all our friends and family come to see us, we can be house proud and show them what we've done. Sounds like you spent all your money on home renovations and the wedding was about sort of getting all the stuff inside it, right? You know, (laughs) kitchenware and kettles and toasters. and Yeah. (laughs) And all that sort of I, I want to go to a quick break, but beforehand, Scott, you talked about lifting a Queenslander, which is one of the, the benefits of these type of properties. Well, what's it cost like to lift a Queenslander? Do you remember the numbers? It was probably back then, but you know, what would you expect to pay now to lift a Queenslander up to build underneath it? Yeah, look, it does vary a bit depending on the size, but you can generally, for a budget just to lift them, around about $50,000. Okay. And then it depends whether you actually close in underneath, you put the slab in underneath. If you do that, you've got to be prepared to have services and have a bit of an idea of what it's going to be like in the future, which is obviously designing and planning so you know where your services go. So a little bit more work in that. If you want to do it where it's up on stilt, slab down, batten it in, that sort of thing, you probably push towards about 100000 then. So, okay. yeah, it's, it's a general guide just to lift them, put them on the steel posts and brace it off at about fifty. 
Mm, okay. And I know a lot of investors think about that when they are looking at Queensland type properties. And, and just the mechanics of doing that, do you just put like beams underneath it with hydraulic lifts? Is that pretty much all it is? Pretty much. The specialists that do it now, they'll yeah. come in and they'll they'll have all the timber chocks. They lift them up as they go, keep chocking it up, and they hydraulic jacks to lift it all up into place. Put the steel, you have to put all new steel beams in underneath, strengthen the existing floor before mm. you can actually lower it back down onto it as well. Okay. How did you do it? You just got some mates over a couple of a couple of slabs of beer and a couple of jacks out of the back of your car. No, no, no. We had it, we had it done properly this time. Yeah. <laughs> right. We've we'll got a quick break. I want to keep down this investor journey. We'll be back in a moment. Worried about making the wrong choice with your next investment? You're not alone. If you truly want to become the master of your own lifestyle design through real estate, then you need to speak with Dashdot Buyers Agents, who will help you acquire cash flow positive properties in high growth areas with value and potential, so you can create more freedom in your life. Visit dashdot.com.au forward slash SPI. Welcome back, everyone. Phil Tarrant here with uh, Scott Melinda Jennison, uh, chatting through their journey as property investors. So you've done the big reno, you've got the house, you're still living in it. That's cool. Manufacture some equity, no doubt. So what was the next step? So you've got this project finished. Tell us about the next investment property, how you sort of financed it and where it was. Well, we were really lucky that we had manufactured equity in the home. So we could use that equity to purchase an investment property. And in actual fact, we purchased the house next door for no other reason other than there was an opportunity to go 50-50 with another neighbour. We recognised that there was a bit of a, a situation a divorce situation and um, they wanted to get out quickly. So we picked that up probably less than what we would have otherwise had to pay if it was on the market and um, it all happened very quickly. So we had a rental property right next door. Okay, cool. So you must have been friends with the neighbours then? <laughs> we just, <laughs> Two ways down. <laughs> we didn't really know the tenants who lived there over the years, but um, we sort of kept to ourselves and you know had property managers looking after it so we didn't have to be involved. Oh, okay, that's pretty cool. And how much did you pay for the next door price? That's a good, mm, question. good question. I I can't remember. It was about three hundred and forty thousand dollars from memory. So it was a slightly smaller block of land, a six hundred block of land, and the Queenslander had already been partially improved. So it was quite a good rental property. It was rent ready pretty much when we purchased okay. it. Yeah. And did you spend a few bucks on doing any more renos to it? You left it as is. Left it as is. That one, yeah. Okay. Yeah. And do you still own it next door? Actually, we sold out. So when we went into that, the exit strategy, because we'd purchased with another partner, the exit strategy was always that one of us would buy the other out. Now we exited that property about six years later. We rode the wave of capital growth, which was great. By the time we'd exited, the property was worth $880,000. And, you know, we just took our 50% 50% share because we really wanted to build our own portfolio at that point and we had the equity stuck in a property that we didn't have complete control over. So we decided to sell to them and continue our journey independently. That makes sense. Was it easy to establish a sale price? Yeah, it really was. Yeah. We yeah. got a couple of appraisals at the time and we come to an agreement that we were both happy with and you know, it was fair and reasonable for both parties. So we moved forward. All right. So that propelled you into more investments. Tell us about what happened next. We bought a unit at Noosa for a lifestyle. We had our two of the three boys that we now have at that time and we decided, I mean, Noosa is a lovely place, let's face it. We decided let's get our own unit so that we can go whenever we want and not be restricted by, you know, when we can get bookings and things. So we bought a two-bedroom unit up at uh, Noosa, which was great, gave us a great lifestyle. When we purchased it, we didn't know how it would perform in relation to, you know, the performance of our other properties, but we actually renovated that as well so that we could add some value to it whilst we went up on holidays a couple of times. It's cool. Was it two bedroom, three bedroom? Yeah, two bedroom with a loft. And we okay. ended up getting in bathroom renovation, kitchen, tiled it, painted and tied up the courtyard area to, to make it a lot more attractive. Mm. Near the beach, you could walk to the beach and all that sort of stuff. Yep. Yeah, it was yeah. great. That's what you need, right? <laughs> so uh, do you still have the property in Noosa? We sold that one as well. We realised after holding it for a number of years that we outgrew it. The size of our family was larger than what the capacity of the unit was. So it was no longer serving its purpose as a lifestyle asset. And it wasn't performing for as an investment. So we decided to exit that and again, just put it into other investments that we knew it would perform in a better way. Okay. And where were they? 
So we purchased another blue chip investment in a city suburb of Wilston, same area as where we live, but it was a renovator as well. And we renovated that property. We purchased it for around $560,000 and spent about $200,000 immediately after purchase. So that forced value into it straight away. We had fantastic depreciation benefits and we could achieve a premium rent. So it put the property almost into a neutrally geared situation from the time of purchase, but in a blue chip location. So that was a really good strategy. And um, that's a property that's still in our portfolio now. Okay. And how did you finance the purchase or the deposit for the property and then also the renovation? Was it all done through cash? Look, equity from our, our home. Back in the day, you actually, you know, lending was quite different to what it is now. You didn't have to put any cash in. You could just use equity from your own principal place of residence and the equity that we'd continued to grow because of the location that we had purchased our own home, it just allowed us to do so much. So that property was purchased through equity and then also, you know, an 80% LVR loan against that property as, as well. So you've had this sort of consistent strategy throughout the whole process of identifying properties with renovation potential in areas which are looking to growth and then doing substantial renovations in order to realize or uplift in value. How much work have you done, Melinda, in and actually understanding the price point that you're buying at versus what you can make it at the end of it? How do you normally sort of how do you know you're buying the right property that you can actually turn into a you know, one of the better properties in the suburb rather than one of the worst properties in the suburb? I think it's about understanding the land value versus the building value. So the land to asset ratio, the higher, you know, the proportion of the land component is, the better it's going to be as a renovator. You know, if you're buying something with land to asset ratio of 80% or more, you know that you've got a great deal because when you're adding value to the home, I mean, the property itself, you can depreciate over time, especially now when you're an investor and you're spending that money on the renovation yourself. The land, however, is the component that appreciates over time. So you want to make sure that you're selecting a location that's got good price disparity between entry level homes and your executive end product. And you want to make sure that you're buying well under the median value when you're entering into that market. So they're all things that we considered at the time. And, you know, making sure that you don't overcapitalize is probably the most critical thing. And that's something that we continue to do by helping clients today. It's just about understanding the suburb and the price disparity within a suburb. Yeah, we touched on how people might get carried away with this new home builder grant in overcapitalizing. And and Scott, you, you spent a couple hundred grand renovating that property. Was it sort of consistent with some of the other renos you've done? You, you didn't deviate away from maybe it sounds like an extension and, and probably some really good cosmetic stuff? Yeah, that one again was lift building underneath, renovate upstairs, cosmetic paint. There was It had good bones. I mean, it was a good size house. It was a good layout. Um, there was an existing pool in there as well. So to me, I say it was pretty easy. But again, that's the vision we have when we look at things and, and we can actually understand and see what you can do and how you can make it to what you want it to be. It's a really good point. Also, you say to you, it was easy. And I think that's a product of experience. And that experience allows you to control the process and the outcome. So easy is good. If things aren't easy, I'd probably say don't do it when it comes to the property. Yeah, definitely. State of mind and confidence. And you can only get that by having expertise in a particular area or at least experience doing it in the past. And that doesn't necessarily mean you need to be a builder to do this type of work, which is, I would say, a huge advantage, but you at least need to know where to find the people to do it and how to actually get them to do it the right way if you aren't a builder. Like, you know, I wouldn't, I would I? Or maybe, I don't know. I wouldn't personally tackle like lifting a Queenslander because, you know, I would need to find someone to do that. And if I didn't know them, I wouldn't have the confidence to make sure it was an easy project. So, you know, you got to stay in your lane sometimes. And the best investors I know, by the way, are builders, they, they normally smash out of the park because they've got so many advantages over us. Luddites that don't know one end of a hammer from another. But um, so you still got this property. What happened after that? Is there any more in the portfolio? Yeah. Yes. So I, because I was obviously doing construction at the time, I built a, a industrial complex. I think it was 18 okay. or 19 units uh, in a small industrial complex for a developer that I was working for. And during that, I negotiated that I would keep one of the units myself. So as we agreed, and then during the process of building it, I decided to try and make it a little bit different to the rest of the units in the complex by adding an extra kitchen upstairs, I think it was, and an extra shower, a bit more paint inside and tidying up. So it was a little bit different, a bit unique compared to all the rest of the 
the warehouses in that same complex. And we've still got that one as well. It's been okay. a really, really good investment. We've had tenants in there the whole time. What sort of tenant do you have in there? What do they do? They we've, distribute medical products. Yeah, that one's medical okay. products now. Yeah, which is, you know, this whole sort of logistics type of stuff is really good for for commercial at the moment as more people buy their stuff online. But um, was that, Scott, was that sort of a an exchange of uh, an industrial unit for time effort working on doing the other stuff? Is that how it worked? We had a bit of an agreement of some of my fees would probably be reduced and then I would pay the difference, obviously, to buy it. Uh, and we'd buy it at the, at the market rate that everyone else was, that he was selling them for. Okay. So a bit of a diversification of portfolio with a commercial asset. Is that the extent of the portfolio or, or there is more? There is more. So at that point, we moved into development and we wanted to, you know, we'd already achieved some good outcomes through renovation and we were managing developments for others through our construction company. So we thought, you know, when we were able to be in the financial position to do our own, we jumped in. So we bought a block of flats in Alderley, which is about six kilometres north of the Brisbane CBD. They happened to be positively geared when we purchased them, but the intent was to knock them down and replace them with seven units, three level walk-up units. And, you know, that was a big project for us to take on for our first residential development project, but we were confident that we could do it because we'd done it for others because of our construction experience. So that was the next thing that we took on. That was in 2011. Okay. That sounds like it probably took a little while to get done. Yeah, there's a little bit of work in that one, a bit of planning, development approvals, building approvals, and then obviously the whole construction. I ran the whole construction myself, so I was involved in that whilst our business was obviously operating in other areas, so we had other projects on at the same time. Mm. Uh, and then, yeah, we built all those seven units and managed to sell them all, actually. Okay, so you didn't keep any at all? You sold a lot? No, that was so through a development company, so the purpose was to for income, but we did put the proceeds into another development site, which was two adjoining houses side by side, uh, because that next project was the next step up for us. And um, we proceeded to get a development approval for 10 units. And those were specifically targeting the downsizer. So owner occupier appeal, looking at the downsizer market, we even had a lift, even though it was a three story walk up because through marketing the first lot of units that we had built, the feedback that we got was that the market wanted, you know, lift access because they're the, mm. the people that our units appealed to just because we had designed them with an owner occupier in mind. Okay. Wow. So you've gone from just accidental renovators to <laughs> it's a good journey. Is that the extent of it or is there more? Well, I mean, that's when probably things changed a bit and we decided to move away from construction yeah. and we decided to obviously to sell that site. And that was going to obviously set us up for, because we'd already set up a little bit of a lifestyle. We liked, we've always worked together and worked well together, Melinda and I. So we decided to obviously start up our business as buyers agents and we wanted to set that up well and, and establish the business. We've got three boys and we obviously want to educate them. So we set up a bit of a plan to set ourselves up for a lifestyle so that we could move forward on our journey We've got the boys going to a private school. We, it pays for their sport. It pays for their education and obviously a plan to set up their future. So that's when we, um, yeah, we sold that to fund all of our lifestyle setup. Sounds pretty good. And sort of if I spoke to your lads, you know, six, seven years ago at school and I said, what do your parents do? What would have they said? They would have just said that dad's a builder. Yeah. Okay. Like <laughs> what would they say now? <laughs> Um, Our youngest <laughs> would just say that um, mum and dad just fly around to speak to people on yeah. podcasts. <laughs> <laughs> and buy property. And buy property. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, I, I don't know what you call it, but uh, that's, that's a really good journey. I like, yeah, I've known you guys for a little while now, but you know, I, I haven't actually dug down into this sort of backstory. I know you as buyers agents rather than as property investors, so mm-hmm. it's been great to actually hear their story and understand how you got to where you're going right now. And sort of the remark I would make is that, you know, you've, you've had a good go at it and you've had a lot of different experiences as property investors, which no doubt, you know, support a lot of the work that you're doing today. So, you know, experience counts and experience matters. Yeah, there's, it's been a journey. And, you know, I think that the more you're in it and the longer you, you know, ride out different cycles, you know, within the property market, you realise that, you know, if you can hold the assets for the long term, that's where the greatest compounding capital growth impact, you know, or effect mm. can be, you know, building, sitting in the background, building your wealth. And, 
you know, we are now in a position where we've set up our own self-managed superannuation fund. We acquired a property within that structure in 2019, just last year. So, you know, we're already setting up now for the next stage, which is a transition period for us where we're wanting to, you know, focus a little bit more on the next 10 years and the plan for, you know, retirement, I guess you could say it is a transition period and you're just wanting to focus less on building that asset base. And now it's that transition period where you're focusing a little bit more on, you know, the cash flow that that portfolio can produce for you. Mm. And, you know, a lot of people, when you ask them, why do you invest in property? They go, well, it's a wealth creation tool. We go, okay, what does that mean? They go, well, hopefully at some point it'll give me choice whether or not I, I need to work or not. And it sounds like you're, you're definitely on that pathway, you know, a, a little bit by accident. A lot of it also planned that, you know, by being a property investor has actually given you a choice to be able to do the business that you're in today. And it sounds as though that's something you're really passionate and love doing and you want to do it for the foreseeable future, but you're already thinking about what that next 10 years look like and, and how that can amplify your ability to have greater choice. Yeah, I think look, I think what we've learned on the journey is, and still learning, you know, we, we keep learning things and, and looking at different things and, and we enjoy it. It's fun for us. We actually really enjoy it. And hence the reason we've gone into the buyer's advocacy side of it and helping mm-hmm. other people along that journey. We get a lot of satisfaction out of looking at property, seeing trying to sort of see what it can look like, what you could do with it, how you could change it, how you could improve it and lift it up in value to help people out as well. Very cool. Yeah, let us time today, coming out of seeing others make money through property in the same way that we have and that's a big part of, you know, what we help people with. Cool. Enjoy the chat. Likewise. Thanks, Thank you. <laughs> Thanks for letting me inside uh, this backstory. Yeah, it's, uh, it's great that you can share it with us. Um, I hope you enjoyed that, everyone. These are the stories that we like to tell, uh, stories of property investment and people doing well out of it. You know, the key point is you've got to get started at some point and whether or not you know why you're doing it at the absolute beginning, it doesn't necessarily matter. Starting, taking action and, you know, taking control of, of your wealth creation journey is the most important step. So if you're sort of doing this stuff and you want to come and have a chat with us on the show, happy to to bring you in all investors, all shapes and sizes, uh, one property, a thousand properties, it doesn't matter. Uh, you can email the team, editor at smartpropertyinvestment.com.au. Scott Melinda Jennison, thanks again for your time. I'll chat again soon. And Melinda, I'll see you in about a week or two, I think, for our live discussion about the Brizzy market. So we want those questions in, don't we? Absolutely. Send the questions in. Happy to answer anything you know that people would like to understand about what's been happening on the back of COVID-19. So um, yeah, really looking forward to having that chat on June 16. Really, I want heaps of stats and numbers. I'm a stats and numbers sort of guy. So, you know, as you know, I've got a lot of property in Brisbane that uh, I've been patiently waiting for it to uh, <laughs> to, to go north. So, uh, I'm, yeah, good part of my education as well. So, I look forward to that chat. Remember to check out smartpropertyinvestment.com.au. You can actually register for our uh, SPI live with Melinda there as well. Just click on the button. You can find it really easily. Social media, Smart Property HQ, you can find us there. I uh, hope you enjoyed the chat today, uh, everyone. Uh, remember, please um, keep those reviews coming uh, wherever you listen to this. The, the team here get a real kick out of it. We'll be back again next time. Until then, bye-bye. The information featured in this podcast is general in nature and does not take into consideration your financial situation or individual needs and should not be relied upon. Before making any investment, insurance, tax, property, or financial planning decision, you should consult a licensed professional who can advise whether your decision is appropriate for you. Guests appearing on this podcast may have a commercial relationship with the companies mentioned. Propertyology regards right now as a very exciting time for investing in Australian real estate. There are some fantastic opportunities that Propertyology can help you take advantage of before buyers re-emerge from their coronavirus cocoons. Propertyology has a national focus. Now more than ever, experience and knowledge are the most valuable currency. Propertyology has that in spades. To find out how Propertyology's multi-award winning buyers agents can help you prosper, contact them now at propertyology.com.au.